and this is a little bit about music lessons anywhere and music lessons anywhere is an online music school which is close to completing 10 years now so congratulations on that and uh, they provide music lessons in different domains of music not only um, music theory but also singing songwriting music technology production homeschooling music in over 40 countries so kudos to that and congratulations to all your efforts and uh, this is a little bit about me i'm kshitish bharadwaj and uh, i have become a finalist and i've also won national level quizzes at the collegiate level and right now after my exams uh, conclude in june i'll be an electrical engineer as well as uh, lmst is here now so this is a short presentation that i've devised to share all that i've learned in a very brief way with you in the lmst is here you can find me on youtube and i have two youtube channels that is uh, hey dear abadi rock stars and uh, hey dear abadi so if you just look for these on YouTube, I request you to kindly like, share, and subscribe to my videos and my channel. Thank you very much. All right. So this is a brief overview of what we're going to look today to all of those who are a little bit older from the 2000s. This is a matrix reference with all of the uh, very cool glasses here. So these are the neos or the ones or the main heroes who were responsible for major disruptions in different eras of Western classical music as you know them today. Uh, it's not that Stravinsky could not wear sunglasses, but he looks more elegant with uh, a pane instead. So we will be looking at Baroque, classical, romantic, and modern eras in today's presentation. This is followed by a quiz on all that you have learned and all that you will be noting down during the presentation. So be ready for a quiz too. Okay, then diving in, we have the Baroque era. As you can see, Baroque era was one of the largest eras in music, which span around 150 years, 1600 to 1750. The Baroque era was something which followed the Renaissance or the rebirth. And during the Renaissance, people in Europe and people in all the European countries, they had a sort of rebirth in music, in philosophy, in science, and the general way they looked at the world, the 1400s and the 1500s. And right now in the 1600s, that perspective did not stop. We had people still questioning the norms, still questioning natural phenomena. And that is what gave rise to Newton's discovery of gravity, which also, by the way, happened during a pandemic in the Baroque era. And then we had uh, Shakespeare, who wrote uh, many of his masterpieces, though he lived only till 16, not six, only six years since the Baroque era. But then we have this Hamlet, which is a kind of revenge story and uh, uh, it uh, taps into fantastical themes as well. And then we have Grandpa Bach, who gave us God's voice and practically did everything, laid the foundation of modern musical history as we know it. If I were to put a name on the Baroque era, I would definitely call it the age of absolution. Now, why is this the age of absolution? It is because kings, that is monarchy, and the church exerted complete control or most of the control over musicians. Bach was a church musician. He was also a royal musician. The king you see in the portrait here is Louis XIV of France, who is also known as the Sun King. Now, he is particularly remarkable because he had the longest reign of any monarch in recorded history. And uh, he was a very royal king. He uh, waged wars and he also developed music in France. He was a great patron of music. Jean Baptiste Lully was one of the famous court musicians at his court. And uh, that, that is someone whom we will be looking at the slide further. Baroque era, if it is characterized by anything, that is ornamentation and extravagant detail. There is a lot of detail in Baroque paintings, Baroque architecture, and Baroque music. 
what people wanted to do was to utilize space. And if you look at that in a musical context, then space between two notes is basically utilized using ornamentation. If you are holding over any note, if you are singing a really long note or if the harpsichord is playing a note, then usually in the Baroque era, it was a practice to introduce some kind of ornament. So in a Baroque score or in a Baroque piece, you might hear a lot of ornaments and in the sheet music, you might see a lot of ornaments like mordants, trills and apogeturas. And then we have some of the major musical developments during this era. One of them was the modern orchestra as we know it. This was the very first time when people combined woodwinds and strings on a large scale together to form the basis of modern orchestra as we know it. One of the first orchestras again was formed in the French court of Louis XIV and that too was formed by John Baptist Lully. And then we have important developments in music theory as we know it. Once you study music theory on a deeper level and uh, on a more advanced level, you will come across terms like tonic, dominant and subdominant, along with figured bass and its realization. These numbers that you see here constitute something called figured bass, which is the practice of elaborating harmony over one single note given in the bass. That is why it is known as figured bass. And then here the numbers, Roman numerals you see are different indications of harmony and chord patterns. So much of chord theory and figured bass evolved in the Baroque era. John Baptist Lully. He was one of the most important composers of the middle Baroque era in the French court. Though he was Italian, he was born an Italian, he slowly made his way in French imperialism and then established himself as one of the most important and one of the most powerful composers. Lully and the 24 violins refers to the orchestra of Louis XIV, which included 24 violins at that time, which were divided into different parts. We had alto violins, we had tenor violins, we had violas and cellos. And then Lully took charge of the 24 violins, he conducted them and he further expanded them to create what was the largest orchestra in Europe in Baroque era. It was a pride of the French court and the English had the chance to witness this and the English court soon copied what the French were doing, but they couldn't match forces, instrumental forces of the French because they also had the grand equest uh, equestrian ensemble, which consisted of woodwinds. And then Lully combined these woodwinds and strings to create a really huge and powerful orchestra. Tidium is one of the grand motets and one of the most important compositions of Lully. And when I say it's a grand motet, this is particularly a French invention. And this was mainly composed during the Baroque era. So this was one of the gems that Lali had come up with and he had composed this uh, to mark the christening of his own son, Louis Lali. And uh, it was published around 1684. But what is remarkable about this composition is, even though it was one of Lali's masterpieces, it also brought about his destructive end. That is, Louis XIV, the king who had employed Lali, once felt sick. And uh, to mark his recovery from this prolonged illness, Lully started uh, to rehearse the Dium with his orchestra. And during the rehearsals, he conducted the orchestra so violently that he hurt his foot and developed that infection and died due to that infection. So it is one of those dramatic Baroque era events where you conduct an orchestra so passionately that it ends up killing you. Now we come to the classical era, which is known for its particular simplicity and its hero is, as we know, Mozart. The classical era, if I were to put it this way, is mainly the era of revolutions. Many revolutions took place in the time frame of 1730 to 1820 that was shown to you. The French Revolution, the American Revolution, and the Industrial Revolution, which was an effect of Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin's discovery of electricity. 
the the americans won independence the french they overthrew imperialism and established their government as we know it and uh, rest is history <laughs> then we had uh, uh, mary wollstonecraft who is the mother of mary shelley the author of frankenstein mary wollstonecraft was also a very famous author herself and her book the vindication of the rights of women is considered to be one of the earliest works on feminist philosophy and about women's rights then we had mozart whom you see here as a cute little baby in this portrait and uh, he's mainly known for his operas so some of his famous operas include don giovanni the magic flute and the marriage of figaro what mozart himself also famously said was that particularly he was an opera composer and only composed concertos or symphonies in his free time so that is why he is known for his operas today the classical era was the age of enlightenment when we had many different philosophies especially from new age philosophers like rousseau and george washington whose uh, seminal ideas were very important in their country winning their independence classical era unlike baroque era did not have a lot of detail it was particularly known for its simplicity its lightness and texture which came out during uh, towards the end of baroque era whom you see here is the artist elizabeth vigi lebron with her daughter so this is a self portrait she was also one of the most famous female artists of her day and she also painted some really famous portraits of uh, mary antoinette the empress of france and as you can see this painting is quite marked with its simplicity you had simplistic architecture which was inspired by ancient greek architecture and that is the reason why this era is also known as the classical era because it was inspired by greek and roman ideals in its architecture and also in its philosophies then some of the major musical developments during the classical era include the invention of symphony concerto and sonata as we know it today franz joseph haydn is the father of all these different forms for he championed them and used them the most in his compositions what you see here is a short version of the concerto mozart's concerto number no. 3 and 5 and that's a very good example of classical music franz joseph haydn franz joseph haydn is due to this prodigious musical output of 340 hours of music which overshadows the output of even bach and handel rightly known as the father of symphonies sonatas concertos and string quartets in fact he was a, one of the first composers along with bach's sons to use the sonata form and he was also one of the champions of the symphonic form having composed more than 100 symphonies and then string quartets is something which we all have to practice as a part of our elmas tcl studies and haydn string quartets are some of the best examples of classical music dostland lied composed in 1797 was the second movement of string quartet opus 76 number no. 3 written by haydn this was written in c major and this was later on adopted as the national anthem of austria hungary back then and today it is the national anthem of germany now this was the second movement and this was also haydn's most favorite melody in fact this was the last melody which haydn played on the piano before he died and that is today known as dostland lied or the german song that is the national anthem of germany the romantic era okay so right now i'd like to pause and ask the audience what they think is the romantic era all about so anyone can raise their hands and what do you think the romantic era is all about so would uh, anyone oh, all right you may go ahead tracy ma freedom of expression <laughs> Oh yes, definitely. After revolutions, after thinking, and after all that absolute monarchy and rule of the church, 
people did want a lot of freedom for themselves. And that is precisely what happened during the Romantic era. Some of the major changes that came across during the Romantic era was, first of all, the invention of light bulb, how people tamed fire, tamed electricity, and brightened up their nights, nighttime, to invent something known as the light bulb by Thomas Alva Edison. Yes, this invention is modern day's most prominent and most important invention, and that was done during the Romantic era. Then we had Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's Faust. All of you must have heard tales of a man making a deal with the devil for many things, eternal knowledge, eternal uh, youth, uh, immortality. All of them, I can say, were inspired by Goethe's Faust. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who is one of the most important thinkers, philosophers, and polymaths of the Romantic era, was also the author of the play Faust, which inspired many symphonies and many pieces after that. In fact, Franz Liszt, whom we see here, wrote a Faust symphony. And then there was Franz Liszt's own son-in-law, who wrote uh, the Faust overture that was about to become his first symphony. And then there was Mahler, who used uh, inspiration from the Faust in one of his symphonies. So Faust was a very, very, very prominent work and a very impactful work during the Romantic era. Listomania. Listomania was a certain sort of, uh, it's, it's not a medical condition, but it's a psychological condition that had gripped most of the people in Europe. Franz Liszt was one of the greatest performers on piano and also one of the greatest performer, uh, composers himself. So Liszt toured Europe with all his extravagant and uh, uh, he performed the flair on the ladies' alpha list, and uh, all the people championed him. So, Listomania was one disease which uh, struck a lot of people during the Romantic era. What Romantic era is marked with most importantly is an ideal known as Romanticism. What exactly is Romanticism? Romanticism, like we heard before. <laughs> Romanticism, like we heard before, is the emphasis on individuality. We looked at the Baroque era, where people were largely under the control of monarchy, kings and churches. And then we looked at the classical era, where people revolted. We had the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Industrial Revolution. And then during Romantic era, people didn't want to be controlled at all. People wanted to express themselves. A lot of composers wanted to express themselves. And that is precisely what composers like Beethoven and Mozart did, especially during their later works. The very term romanticism evolved and was coined by the great polymath E.T.A. Hoffman in his essay of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. That's where he called Beethoven's Fifth Symphony as a quintessence or the best example of romanticism. And that is where we get the term romanticism from. Then we had paintings like uh, J.M.W. Turner, The Fighting Temeraire here. And the paintings are very expressive. They have a lot of emotion. People experimented with colors, different types of applications. What you see here is the fresco known as the War of Huns and how it's being glorified here. And there's a lot of emotion in these two paintings seen here. This is. Uh, the quintessence of romanticism, once again, a painting known as The Desperate Man by Gustav Corbe, where he expresses his own desperation. This is the self-portrait, in fact. And all of romantic works, symphonies, piano sonatas, concertos, all have this hallmark of expression and emotion. People used the entire range of the piano. They weren't restricted to two octaves or three octaves. They used really low notes and really high notes. The violin became the queen of the instruments, and people wrote a lot of music for the brass instruments, which were championed and which gained a lot of uh, liberty and development during the Romantic era. Then we had musical, important musical developments. Well, whom you see here is Franz Liszt, whom you saw in the last page, one of uh, the very embodiments of the term Romanticism. 
he was a very passionate and a very emotive individual himself composing in all the all the different kinds of forms that are available and he wrote only one sonata and that is an extremely difficult sonata for the piano and uh, that is something which we study at the post graduate level in music and then he also came up with a type of composition known as symphonic poems and he championed program music music that is inspired by paintings music inspired by plays music inspired by stories music inspired by events something which you could give a title to let us say like on the steps of central asia or the war of the huns or music inspired by historical characters in fact list himself wrote a piece a symphonic poem inspired by hamlet shakespeare's hamlet which we saw before and then people started to use chromaticism very freely this was about emotion so why should people stick to rules yes people did follow rules and after that they also shifted a little bit towards individual expression and that's where chromaticism came in a lot of people wanted to express their own disinterest and distaste with what was happening in the socio political scenario and that is where chromaticism came in alexander borodin so how many of you have actually studied science in the university level here a show of hands please has uh, anyone studied science or chemistry in their uh, university all right my father is an engineer <laughs> he is studying science he is raising his hand and uh, that's precisely what alexander borodin also did he was a very famous doctor and also a very famous chemist alexander borodin was one of the most important figures in romantic science and also in romantic era music that is because he established the saint petersburg medical college for women and he also taught there uh, two years until his death until two years uh, before his death and he was a very famous chemist had a lot of work in organic chemistry there is this uh, borodin uh, hansdiker nucleophilic substitution reaction and uh, there is also aldol condensation a uh, type of uh, special reaction that borodin had discovered and apart from that he was also part of the five and he also wrote a symphonic poem known as this on the steps of central asia now this symphonic poem is particularly interesting because it evokes an oriental landscape in the romantic era people wanted to explore something out of their own countries they were mostly interested in the far east philosophies of india china and japan middle east and that's where the term orientalism comes from nikolai rimsky korsakov's work shehrzad is a very oriental work he also wrote 1001 nights and then we have borodin here with in the steps of central asia which is a symphonic poem that evokes an oriental landscape about a caravan going through a central asian desert it's a very amusing and a very it's a very amazing work of uh, romantic era music and i suggest that everyone at least listens to it once and yes borodin's melodies were very special a lot of his songs a lot of his themes some parts of string quartets were adapted into songs in the 20th century and they were used in the famous uh, broadway musical kismet and for his work and his adaptations though borodin wasn't alive he got a posthumous tony award which is given to broadway musicals for his work in kismet the modern era now this is something which is just a few years before our own times and uh, if i could explain the modern era it was uh, a mixture a sort of very fast and rapid developing era which saw a lot of genres come up let's take a look at that a lot of calamities catastrophes great things happened during the era we had the nobel prize being given out and uh, we had einstein who is one of the greatest figures in science known for his theory of relativity we had the two world wars bringing about immense devastation and destruction upon the world and then we had stravinsky who is equally responsible for causing a musical riot 
on the very first day of the premiere of his work known as the right of spring now the right of spring was a very different work it uh, had a lot of uh, revolutionary ideas which stravinsky introduced there he put two chords together and then he had this wild rhythm going on and then it was also a ballet so people had visuals to go along with that and many people were shocked when it was first presented to the world it was about this ancient uh, pagan russian rite during the spring in which a uh, virgin girl is sacrificed to satiate the god of spring and towards the end the girl just dances and dances and dances and until she uh, just dies so people saw that choreography and all of them were shocked even the musical musical part of it was so revolutionary that's what caused uh, a musical riot and that is the right of spring if i were to put one word to describe the 20th century that would be phantasmagoria or phantasmagoria what does phantasmagoria mean phantasmagoria means a series of very rapidly moving uh, pictures or uh, a very uh, rapid and uh, uh, it's a uh, very rapid event which uh, leaves you exhausted and it consists of many elements here and there going on and you aren't able to pay attention on one single element at a time you see here picasso's paintings there are so many elements in it picasso used cubism and he was also one of the greatest champions of art in fact picasso was uh, one of the best friends of stravinsky having uh, developed the costumes for the right of spring he also made a caricature for stravinsky during one of their conversations you had the world wars people fighting wars over uh, politics and uh, over uh, different issues in the world you had rapid advancement technology and science man went to the moon during the 20th century we had rockets being launched we had technology things like ovens refrigerators cookers coming to houses and people using them every day musical developments of 20th century are immense and there are huge musical developments in the 20th century there are many genres that came about we have jazz rock hip hop folk music being given importance and then there was serialism on a advanced scale and then there were a uh, lot of chromaticism which branched out later into serialism and uh, usage of 12 tone rows and you had development of electronic musical instruments what you see here is an instrument which you play without touching and it's known as the theremin and uh, it uses electromagnetic fields to uh, generate sounds what you see here is a small example of a usage of note row to compose a piece so these are the major musical developments during the 20th century claude debussy claude debussy is perhaps the biggest change in music since mozart now why is that if you listen to debussy's music it's completely different from all that happened in the romantic era which was just before the 20th century there are different harmonies debussy has totally deconstructed form and uh, all of his music if it were to be um, attributed to one single word that would be organic debussy's music is the perfect complement of nature and it's in fact inspired by debussy's study and observation of nature his reverence of nature and all of that can be summed up in one word and that is organic music music in the form that came to him he just wrote it down on paper and that's how he uh, made different he in fact wrote an opera as well and he wrote only one piece that can be considered as a symphony and that is la mer or the sea though mu debussy is known for musical impressionism a term that he himself did not like so impressionistic effects you had different effects of light you had uh, effects that gave you impressions like flowing water or blowing wind and effects that the musical effects that had an impression of uh, shining uh, shining sunlight different effects of light all of those them could be captured by debussy using instrumental effects and that's why he is also known as one of uh, the originators of musical impressionism la mer or, or the sea is a tone poem or symphonic poem by debussy is also an example of program music because this type of music has a subject it is inspired by the sea 
and this could be considered as one of Debussy's symphonies. And uh, it has three movements in it. This was one work which I had studied during my Elmas TCN, and uh, it describes different scenarios. It gives an impression of different scenarios at sea. In the very first movement, you have dawn breaking over the sea, and then people observing the sea up until uh, noon, and then great waves crashing against the shore. In the second movement, you have play of the waves, how different uh, water waves just played around at sea, and how Debussy as an acute observer with his keen memory wrote all that down and translated that into music. And then in the very last moment, you have an epic dialogue between the wind and the sea. So this is one composition which is a must listen. And I think this might change your entire perspective about music too. Pleasure was one law which Debussy followed. For him, there were no laws. People thought harmony, form, and uh, all of these were laws for people. People had to obey some kind of tonality, modulate after eight bars, modulate after 16 bars. But Debussy did not follow any of this. He, came, he wrote what came to him. He wrote what pleased him. He wrote what came to him from the reverence of nature and as worship. For him, music was nothing but a religion. It was very sacred to him. What you see here is a block print, a Japanese block print, which uh, fascinated Debussy. And this is from a collection known as the 36 Views of Mount Fuji. It was made by a Japanese artist called Katsusika Hokusai. So Debussy chose this particular piece. Uh, one of it uh, was in his rooms when he was uh, composing La Mer. And this was chosen as the cover page for La Mer 2. So that also includes one of the main features of Debussy's music, that is Japonism, which is an inspiration from Japanese and Far East culture. There are a lot of um, usages of uh, pentatonic scales, minor and major pentatonic scales, which are common in Chinese music as well as Debussy's music. So Debussy is one composer which everyone must listen to. All right, so that brings us uh, to the very end of our presentation here. And I urge all of you to get ready for the quiz. And I hope all of you have taken notes. May those notes help you during the quiz. While answering the questions, you can either message me directly or you can raise your hands and uh, answer, them, answer the questions directly. If you need any clues, you are very free to ask me and I will provide you some clues for the questions. So all the best. Please refrain from Googling the answers to maintain the spirit of quizzing. These are authentic questions that I have formed based on uh, the presentation that you have just seen. So Googling the answers will spoil all the fun. So please don't do that. The very first question, blast from the past. Spatial audio is a new sonic experience being provided by Apple Music to all its users. But this technology is not new in itself. Since the 1580s, spatial sound has been a common experience to the citizens of a city known as Y. All thanks to X. X is the monument given here and its unique architecture, the balconies given inside X. So any guesses what X and Y could be? Any guesses? You can raise your hands and uh, answer these questions. Anyone? All right. So according to some X is uh, Greece, but uh, I would like to tell you that here X is the monument. So X is not the city. The city is Y and uh, X is the monument. So what are X and Y? All right, then moving on. X is St. Mark's Basilica, which is an excellent example of Baroque architecture and Y is Venice. So if anyone ever goes to Venice or if you live in Venice, please do visit the St. Mark's Basilica. And it's an exa excellent example of music as well as sound. All right, someone has answered St. Mark's. Yeah, that's right. Moving on, that's by conducting. Though Italian, X uh, emigrated to France at a young age and quickly established himself as the most prominent composer of the country. 
Though he first started off as a Harlequin, a type of comic performer, he went on to invent the practice of conducting the orchestra. Sadly, he beat time too violently while conducting one of his masterpieces, fatally injured himself. This led to his death in 1687. So who is this man who died while conducting one of his pieces? Any guesses? Luli. Hmm? Luli. Luli. Uh, and uh, who was that? Or may I know who that was? Komodo champion. Great, sir. Thank you very much. That is John Baptist Lully. He was one of the first examples of uh, people dying due to conducting. A very passionate man. And he literally beat himself while beating time, which is baited. So, very well done on that one. Moving on. It's Father's Day today. And here's a special Father's Day question for all of you. One of the greatest composers ever, Franz Joseph Haydn, or Papa Haydn, as he's known today, is also known as the father of symphony, but he's also the father of the string quartets, the sonatas, and harmony, as a historian put it. The second movement of the string quartet, uh, Opus uh, 76, number three, was his most favorite tune and is widely recognized today as X. So what did Haydn write, which is today known as X? Any guesses? All right, Paul answer? wants to tell. <laughs> All right, Mr. You Paul. Want me you want me to answer? Uh, yes, sir. I think uh, there's Mr. Paul who has raised his hand. Yes. Okay, let him answer. Um, hi, it's the uh, German national anthem. Very well done. It is the German national anthem, and it was yes. the national anthem of Austria as well till its disintegration in 1918. So, very well done on that one. Okay. So name one significant historical event, work or piece of art that shaped society in each era. So you're all free to write it down in the chat box. Please send your response in the chat box. <laughs> okay. Um, romantic was the light bulb. Uh, yes, romantic was uh, just before the modern era. All right, so I have uh, a few uh, responses here, and all of these responses are correct. Yes, and that shows how acutely you have been observing my presentation. So thank you for all your attention and responses. Good, that's nice. So some of you have written the light bulb. And uh, there is Picasso's cubism, and there was uh, a desperate man. Though a desperate man uh, wouldn't be a significant event, that is an uh, example of uh, one of uh, uh, romantic artworks. But uh, yes, so shall I move on to the answers now? All right, then moving on to the answers. Right, romantic women's rights. No, sorry, cl classical women's rights. Yes. Classical era saw the development of women's rights for the first time. All right. So here okay. we have uh, some examples. So what everyone has written here in the chat box, all of them are correct. And here are some more examples to go along the way. So, uh, oh yeah, I said piece of art. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, Miss Catherine. The question says uh, piece of art here. I, I, I'm sorry to have uh, overlooked that. So a desperate man is uh, correct, and uh, Kath uh, Miss Catherine gets full points for that. So um, moving on then. 
we have the polymath, an accomplished physician, doctor, and chemist. Alexander Borodin was a part of the Russian group called the Five. He is known for creating nucleophilic substitution and aldol reactions in chemistry. Which much loved symphonic poem by Borodin evokes an Oriental landscape? All right then. So, uh, do I see some hands there? Mr. Paul has uh, raised his hand once again. Okay then. Uh, so, should I go with Mr. Paul, or would anyone else like to try? It? Okay, Dana has raised a hand. So. Uh, please unmute yourself, Dana. Which piece is it? Can you please tell us? In the steppes of Central Asia. Very good. That's absolutely correct. In the steppes of Central Asia, uh, it's uh, something which you have mentioned in the chat box as well. It's one piece which evokes a scene of a caravan riding through Central Asian desert. In this, what's remarkable is Borodin uses a pedal point of almost 23 bars. So you have the violins playing one single note for 23 bars just to depict silence and uh, just to depict the alienation of Central Asia. So that is something which is very remarkable and I think everyone should listen to this. All right, another general question. The 20th century was undeniably eventful and one of the fastest growing eras. Which new genres came into being in the 20th century? For example, jazz. So what are the different genres that came into being? So all of you are free to uh, give your responses in the chat box once again. All right. We have uh, rock, punk rock, contemporary, mm -hmm. rock and roll. Very good. Electronic music, yes. Any more responses? Folk, uh, though I would say folk music has been going on since a long time, it was only during the 20th century that it was given importance. You had uh, Bela Bartok who gave a lot of importance to Hungarian folk music. Serialism, hip hop, very good. All right then, so moving on to the answer. We have jazz, rock and roll, rhythm and ballad, pop, hip hop, electronic, serialism, anything from even 21st century music. Musical theater, Broadway, film music, and uh, Bollywood. Those of you who are uh, fans of Indian movies <laughs> must be knowing Bollywood. So Bollywood songs and uh, Bollywood music is something which we all Indians are very proud of. <laughs> so definitely check that out someday. All right then. This one. Igor Stravinsky was one of the most influential composers of the 21st, 20th century. His famous ballet, The Rite of Spring, almost caused a riot during its premiere. Which famous artist drew the composer's caricature shown in this image here? Any guesses? All right. So one of you has given me the answer here. All right, it's two of you now. All right, so uh, would uh, anyone else like to try? I will go with this. Okay, so I'll give you a clue for this. He was one of the most famous artists in the 20th century. He had cubism. All right, so I have an answer. All right, Mr. Paul wants to try once again. All right, let's give him a chance then. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, I, I should have said at the beginning. It does look looking at the the way those those hands work and the line work. It's it's got to be Picasso. Definitely, you're absolutely right. And uh, also, I got the answer from Tracy, Dana, and uh, Miss Catherine. So all of you are right. It is Pablo Picasso. It's Stravinsky by Picasso. In fact, if you look at the 20th century, then all of these artists they had a very uh, good group, I must say. Stravinsky was associated with Picasso, and then Stravinsky was also a one-time alleged lover of uh, Coco Chanel. He had stayed with Coco Chanel in her mansion in France when his family was on the run. And uh, he also had a tea with President Kennedy. So Stravinsky was in a way a very popular figure in 20th century music. All right, then. This is uh, the last question for today. 
La Mer by Claude Debussy is one of the best examples of musical impressionism. The painting featured on the cover page of the work is a famous Japanese block print called The Great Wave of Kanagawa by Hokusai. In which other way do we commonly come across this artwork? This uh, huge wave you see here. Have you seen it anywhere else? Especially in your daily life. I can give you a clue. You see it every day. You see it every day. Almost every day, if you have paid attention to it. So where do you see the great wave of Kanagawa every day? No, we definitely don't have this uh, at our homes. Uh, some of you might be having this, but uh, we do have it in our perspective. But uh, where do we use it? Any clues? Do you want any clues? Or should I show you the answer? Have you seen this uh, anywhere, this wave here? Does it seem familiar? I can see some of you nodding your heads and uh, wondering, uh, trying to remember, recall, trying to relate. All right, it's not fair on my part. I haven't mentioned this in the presentation, but uh, this was something I wanted to uh, just ask for fun. All right, so let's look at the answer now. We use it as an emoji. So this is uh, the wave emoji, and uh, that is inspired by the great wave of Kanagawa by Hokusai. So you can see that is the same artwork that's used in both the places. And that is one reason why all of us have been noticing it every day, but not quite observing. So the next time you see any interesting thing around you, try to find out why is it this? What's the history behind it? And is there a story that seems to be interesting? And after that, I take your leave. Thank you very much for attending my presentation today. Your interest and attendance is much appreciated and respected. Thank you very much. I hope you have learned something to take away from this. I had a really good time presenting this to all of you and the quiz also was, I hope you had fun doing the quiz too. So thank you very much, everyone. Shitesh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to present this to us. I, I, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. So packed full of interesting facts. It must have taken you such a long time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mom. Thank you so much for uh, giving me a chance to present what I've learned. Though this is a small part of what's covered in the Elmas TCL course, I hope this arouses interest in our audience to uh, study music theory more seriously and, and at an advanced level. So thank you for giving me this chance and I hope to have inspired you today. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Come off mute, everybody, if you want. <laughs> Sorry about the cafe music. <laughs> That was that Thank was you. wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely wonderful. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Loved it. Thank, Loved Thank it. you so much, Mr. Paul, great. for your involvement. In fact, I must say this is the first time I'm uh, uh, seeing Mr. Paul face to face. Uh, he was uh, one of those uh, uh, hidden guardians of music theory, or music lessons, anywhere I can say, right? Yeah, that's right. for sure. Cheerio. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. Thank you so right. much. So, uh, if you could all just switch on your videos and maybe have a group picture once, just a group picture. Uh, all right, don't worry, that uh, other device is also mine. I was looking at your answers with that. Yeah. So, smile, please. <laughs> have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you so much for taking out your time and have a great time learning. Thank you very much.